be with us again this 21st of September 2020. Trust you have been well. Time for a discussion. Now we look at the state of the nation and most uh, importantly, the role of the church in the national discourse. A brief rundown of the things we'll talk about. We'll be looking into the COVID-19 response, how things have been. And you remember the church was the first respondent to the COVID-19 protocols, all the guidelines that were given by the Ministry of Health and the government at large. We'll be also looking at the political drum beats that have begun. We're talking about the campaigns of the 2022 general elections. We have been seeing what has been going on. And of course, we will be looking into corruption. There's a case going on on the COVID-19. Uh, you could say billionaires that like it has been put there in the public domain. Uh, money has been eaten. And so uh, KEMSA is one of the uh, agencies or the departments that is being looked into. Uh, we have uh, other corruption cases going on with our governors, <coughs> the latest being the uh, Migori governor, Obado, and of course we've also had others who have been uh, charged with corruption and lastly we'll be looking into the leadership and the kind of dignity and respect our leaders have are they sending a good message to us here when they um, they speak the kind of uh, words they speak to the audience or to the public is it a good message i'm speaking to political analyst Socrates Private and Reverend Michael Courier will be looking so much into this. Keep it Y254. Send us your comments on all on all our social media platforms, Y254 channel on Facebook and Twitter. My name is Deva Hilary. Welcome to the program. Gentlemen, good morning and welcome. Now, uh, Rev, I want to begin with you uh, regarding COVID-19. When COVID-19 landed in Kenya, and it was first reported in March, the first protocols or the guidelines that were given by the government was the social distancing effect. And they looked into the social places, and one of them was the church. And the church was told, Hakuna Church, Zika Fungwa. Uh, other places remained, like the bars and what have you, but later they were closed. But looking into the church, it was affected. Uh, this is a place where people go for uh, spiritual nourishment or gain, having the strength and we were in a pandemic. Someone would have hoped church would have been the best place like it happens in, when other calamities come, the church is there, um, comes to be a safe haven for us but now we were not going to church. Now how the church responded to the government's directive? Do you think in other f areas or in other forms of the government's directive, this is what should be done? Uh, well, Hillary, I must confess that as a church, we were one of the institutions that was uh, heavily hit. Because in the history of the Church of Kenya, nothing like that has ever happened. Mm -hmm. Where one day you just received a directive from the government that due to COVID-19, mm -hmm. you are hereby directed to you know, clothes shop. Yeah. And that means there is nothing that should be happening in church. The Sunday worship was suspended. Mm -hmm. And that came as a surprise. And it also brought a lot of trauma, and especially to those people who have been accustomed to attend church every Sunday, and especially the elderly. Mm -hmm. You know, the, that was their lifestyle, that uh, on Sunday, I just wake up, I shower, I take my breakfast, and then I go to church. Because there is something uh, that church does to people. You know, it's an opportunity for you to bond with God. Right. It's an opportunity for you to pray. It's an opportunity for you to hear the word of God. Mm -hmm. It's also an opportunity for you to interact with other Christians, all right? Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine the absence of that. And that is why a majority of, uh, initially, a majority of the people did not take that kindly. Mm -hmm. And if you can remember, uh, immediately after the directive, even after a month, some people were still, especially mm. the diehards, mm. you know, <laughs> they still uh, continued attending church until the government put down its feet and say, hey guys, this thing is really, really serious. Mm. But uh, from where I seated, I think uh, uh, the church, uh, the government would have done uh, a little bit more consultation with the leaders of the church because mm -hmm. the church mm -hmm. has its own systems and structures on how to do things. You know, disregarding all that and then bombarding us with directives, mm -hmm. which we eventually obeyed as faithful 
good godly citizens mm -hmm. but i think a little bit uh, consultation will have been done mm -hmm. all right because mm -hmm. there are some churches which are big and they can be able to uh, comfortably have a service you know and observe the 1.5 or 2.5 or whatever distant it is mm -hmm. yes so, just before i let you go uh, the message that the church sent, mm -hmm. do you think the members of the public or the public in general, do you think they took it kindly in, in regards to being disciplined as a people? Okay, well, they did not take it kindly. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the reason as to why they did not take it kindly. Because the details that were given, were being given out, they were still scanty, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I think the government had not done proper civic education, you know, in informing people this is where COVID-19 started, this is what COVID-19 is, these are the effects, and this is actually what you will do. You see, there is a sense in which people felt betrayed. It's like, uh, if I have some information, mm -hmm. yeah, I need to relay it to you in a very clear manner. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I paint a picture so that at least even by the time we are making a collective decision, mm -hmm. I, don't feel, um, I, I, I don't feel kind of betrayed. I don't feel like uh, you've ignored me. And that is what uh, the church felt. And by the way, mm -hmm. a lot of people but at that particular point, and uh, there was this debate, that uh, there is probably something that the government is hiding. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Not that the government was hiding something, although it is not for me to be the advocate for the government, right. but you see when you do not release uh, full information, when you do not shed light on certain things, mm -hmm. and you see, um, at least a majority, I, I, I think, uh, is it many people or all Kenyans, they have never been in a pandemic. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I think the last pandemic to be experienced in the world, was it in 1918? Maybe some mm -hmm. can tell me. <laughs> the Spanish flu. The flu, yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now you can imagine you're telling people a pandemic. Number one, somebody does not understand what a pandemic is. Or an epidemic. Or an <laughs> epidemic. Okay? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, there is an atmosphere of fear that has been created, mm -hmm. you know. And then all of a sudden, there is a cessation of movement, mm -hmm. and there is curfew, and then there is lockdown. Now you can imagine all this confusion. Now, since time immemorial, people have always found refuge in church. True. You know, and if you look at the history of Israel, even when the temple was being constructed, when Solomon dedicated the temple to God, this is the prayer he made, mm -hmm. that God, in times of pandemic, in times of war, in times of epidemic, mm -hmm. even when we have sinned against you and there is disaster in the land, mm -hmm. when we come and call on your name in this temple, hear our prayer. Mm -hmm. Now, in the midst of a pandemic, now people are being told, do not even dare go to church. I believe God is omnipresent <laughs> and God is everywhere. Mm -hmm. But now people are wondering, now, if you're not being allowed to go to church, now, where mm -hmm. will we go? And so all of a sudden, there was a, a, an atmosphere of fear, hopelessness, yeah. anxiety, mm -hmm. and nervousness. And you can remember, it is during that season that actually a lot of depression mm -hmm. and stress started taking place. True. It is during that season, again, that gender-based violence actually started increasing. Mm -hmm. And it was very fast. It started rising and they were saying 42%. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, and teenage pregnancies, which would later be uh, backtracked to be false information. Now, uh, Socrates, just like <coughs> Reverend has mentioned, when COVID-19 came, there mm. were restrictions, especially the cessation of movements in mm. and out of several counties in the country. And then there was coffee, which is still in force even today. Uh, we are hoping the head of state will be uh, lapsing it maybe sometime this week. If it does, I know it will benefit the majority of us. Now, how we responded to COVID-19 as compared to other nations and what we have had uh, in terms of the fatalities from other um, foreign nations and even our neighbors. Yeah. Here we are, our numbers are going down, but the Ministry of Health is insisting we should not lower our guards. Yeah. To this end, do you think Kenya has handled COVID-19 in a right way, observing the human rights and of course caring for the uh, public. Well, thank you so much, Hilary. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Now, uh, moving fast, I think uh, it's been a lukewarm approach from uh, either of the divides, the government, and of course the larger citizenry. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of policy, they did what they had to do. Uh, the clarion uh, 
a role of any government in the world is to, to take care of the lives of its citizens and their properties. Okay, uh, that's where most policies are drawn from. So it's only natural that they had to regroup, uh, uh, reanalyze policies, especially in public health, bring newer, you know, things, a cessation of movement, things like masks and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. That was a spirited attempt by government to, to make sure guys are safe, to make sure lives are not lost, because that is their cl uh, on uh, role. As, as, a, as a governing institution. But then uh, the media, the media kept on uh, bringing alternative narrations, okay? A mm -hmm. uh, uh, popular, uh, one of the TV stations aired that, whereas the government was advocating for guys to really take care of themselves through the protocols that were brought on board by World Health Organizations and MOH, mm -hmm. There were billions of monies that <laughs> the Kenyan version of money haste, you know, monies were being taken away, meant for 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 for, for public to 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 help them themselves from you know contracting the, the, the disease and whatnot. So whereas we want to really thank MOH and of course the entire government for moving with speed not only to update us on the the, the 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 curve how it's behaving but also you know giving aid to vulnerable communities arid and semi-arid lands re receiving relief food and whatnot mm -hmm. we are also nostalgic about government's behavior uh, borrowed from things that were aired on the media so i think from my end it's been lukewarm but we've tried in comparison with other states mm -hmm. i want to compare the south african uh, the South, South Africa as a, a nation, mm -hmm. we, we did well. Uh, we, we really obeyed some of these guidelines that were brought on board. Mm -hmm. uh, guys began working from home. Guys became biased to technology. Guys would, you know, Zoom and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Because they really felt that this pandemic, the only way we, we are going to control it is by listening to what government is saying and staying at home. Mm -hmm. That's why to this date, I think it's been four months, Right, and uh, the curve is finally finding its way down. Uh, life and the normalcy is uh, finally getting back, and uh, and things like that. When we thought that we are going to have dead bodies in the streets of Nairobi, when we thought that government is going to procure, uh, you know, these death bags so that you know mass graves and whatnot, the opposite has come on for. Right. right, and now we can see that the numbers are going down, people are getting lives, and the best thing is that vaccines that offer an antidote to this particular virus mm -hmm. are being engineered. Mm -hmm. So, we did well as a citizenry, mm -hmm. yeah. All right, uh, Rev, I think it was the first uh, that very week when the COVID 19 was uh, reported to have been confirmed in Kenya, mm -hmm. and the president. Uh, called on the church. Mm. There were national prayers. Mm. And uh, it's true Kenya is a country that revokes uh, the name of God. Today, the numbers of fatalities as compared to other nations, you could say they are low. Yes, people have lost their lives, 500 and something. is. It's not just numbers, those are lives of people. Mm. But of course, looking at our case, Kenya, comparing to other nations, mm. are we favored of God? Uh, the prayers worked. Most definitely. Mm -hmm. I normally say that if there is a man to pray, mm -hmm. then there's a God to listen True. and to answer those prayers. Mm -hmm. And I think we should, we should uh, we must never underestimate the power of prayer. True. You know, our God is real. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, just like Socrates has said, there was a conversation that probably by September or August, mm -hmm. uh, that Africa would be, people would be dropping dead. And I hear there were some people who were even preparing, they had bought many body bags, mm -hmm. you know, preparing for business. But you <laughs> see, God is not like a man, mm -hmm. you know, he's in heaven. And so I believe God just had mercy on us, and then he favored us. And we also would like to thank God so much for the rapid response from different quarters. Sure. You know, the doctors, the nurses, the religious leader, you know, the government. I think that concerted effort uh, coupled up with prayer. It, uh, and then uh, people started, there was a time that uh, people now took it seriously, you know, and they started completely adhering to government's directive. You know, little things like washing your hands, 
mm. uh, putting on a mask, social distancing, mm. avoiding crowded places, mm. you know, mm. yeah, because the same Bible tells us that faith without action yes, is yeah. dead, that even in as much as you're asking God to protect you, yes, he will protect you, mm. but he has also given us a mind, you know, yeah, you cannot tell the Lord to protect you from the fire, and then you walk right into the fire. Mm -hmm. You know, you're telling God, protect me from the fire. But when you get a fire extinguisher, you actually use it now to put out the fire. But I must agree with you that, yes, we are favored of the Lord. Were it not for the Lord, I think right now the situation will be totally different. Mm -hmm. You can remember the first time, man, uh, my wife stayed in the house mm -hmm. for three months. Fear. Yes. And the restrictions that were there. Yeah, and our children. Mm -hmm. In fact, I remember where we stayed. We even, uh, I think some few mamas, they just went to the garden and said, please, can you just uh, do not allow anybody to come in here? Mm. You know, because there was that atmosphere of fear. You know, you don't know what will happen next. Mm -hmm. You remember, even there's a time, uh, supermarkets, you know, when you go to the shelves, there was nothing. There was panic shopping. Mm -hmm. People are, uh, you know, buying all... Especially sanitizers. Sanitizers. <laughs> Alcohol-based. You know, <laughs> Alcohol-based, um, tissue papers, mm -hmm. food stuff. Mm -hmm. You get my point? Yeah. Uh, because people did not know what will happen next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah? All right. Mm -hmm. And so you can, when you compare where we are at right now, mm -hmm. yeah, from the beginning, I think God has been so gracious to us we thank God that finally the curve is flattening. We also thank God that slowly by slowly we are returning back to a new normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, it will really take time before we get to where we were. In fact, I don't think we will ever get to where we used to be. We've already been introduced to a new normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Like there are some people right now. Uh, you've got it to a point where even if you don't wear, when you don't wear a mask, you feel like there is something wrong. Mm, Especially yeah. when you're in a mat or mm. when you're in a crowded place. Mm. Or yeah. you see a group of people and you're like, I, do I have a mask? Exactly. <laughs> and so we would like to thank the very many people who just went down on their knees mm. because uh, that is the only hope that was left. True. Yes. Now, Socrates, there are uh, restrictions still in force. <laughs> like the pubs are, just the other day it was realized they were operating and it was not uh, okay since they were MOH guidelines and protocols. Mm -hmm. The restaurants are operating within minimum time. If uh, the president uh, now lapses the or isn't the restrictions that are currently in force, do you think things will better in terms of the curve that you are seeing, like it's uh, coming down? Do you mm -hmm. think things will be worse, or uh, are we are we have uh, do we will we have a likelihood of a surge in mm -hmm. numbers? Uh, well, I, I, would, I, would, I would want to downplay the likelihood of a surge because then uh, look at the only place right now that is completely restricted in terms of access are pubs. Mm -hmm. Churches are beginning to have numbers despite directives, right? Mm -hmm. uh, restaurants are having numbers despite, you know, all that. So you are not going to tell me that the moment we open the pub today, we are going to have a surge. <laughs> well, it, there could be a surge, but on a neglig uh, negligible percentage, right? Mm -hmm. It goes back to personal responsibility. It goes back to you as Hillary, right? That this thing, you've seen it, it's there, right? As much as you are a user to a pub, you really don't want to go there as a person. You don't have to be forced by government. And I think right now government should uh, shy away from doing the, 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 the things they've done for the last four months, but start giving civic education on how to approach COVID-19 mitigation at a personal level. They should find mechanisms of teaching communities that this thing now is a personal responsibility. It demands for certain level of discipline, mm -hmm. right? Change of life, change of lifestyle, right? We have people who are at, uh, at, 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 at the red light, you know, the asthmatics, the, the, the diabetics, and, the, and the, the sort of that, that group, right? Mm -hmm. so, so they have to find a way of offering certain level of capacity built into vulnerable communities so that going forward, the, the, the club is open, yes. It's very open. You have the freedom to walk in. But remember, these are, place, these are hot spots. 
So the discipline in your mind tells you that, no, don't go there. There's a chance you'll catch this thing because you don't know who is in there, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I just think it boils down to personal responsibility. Uh, let let government continue to you know put up the protocols yes for all the places President Uru is uh, we are really looking forward to him giving us a national directive going forward but I strongly feel that they should transcede mm -hmm. from offering uh, you know all these things they are offering and all these numbers they keep on giving us to invest on uh, capacity building for the societies around the republic going forward that will help all right now rev we must agree lives were affected mm. emotionally economically people lost their jobs and i want to indulge you in this what did the church do even being closed at the time because mm -hmm. now yes churches have begun uh, operating not as normal mm. but now during that particular period of time when churches were closed mm. what were the church doing to the people uh, you see now when uh, it was announced that uh, now Kenya has been affected by COVID and uh, there were lockdowns and uh, the church was shut down the schools were locked mm -hmm. uh, some people who were in businesses you know businesses started shutting down mm -hmm. and there were job losses and uh, there was all this confusion that that was happening and so many people actually slipped into depression because uh, you're used to coming here every morning mm -hmm. and now all of a sudden you're not coming here and this is where you get your daily bread mm -hmm. uh, People started receiving half salaries, you know, maybe the first month, the second month, by the third month, some people are not receiving anything, yet you have a family to feed. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we did as a church is that we went to our reservoir, our reserve fund. Mm -hmm. There's a small fund that we normally have to support people. Mm -hmm. And so some of the needy cases that were coming to the church, mm -hmm. we would uh, give them food, all right? Mm -hmm. Uh, something at least to carry them uh, through the week. Number two, we had some people come in, coming in, mm -hmm. at least people who are uh, blessed by the Lord financially, mm -hmm. you know. And then we opened up another kitty, you know, where people would you just amalgamate their funds, mm -hmm. and then uh, we would get a list of the needy people, mm -hmm. and uh, we would give them food, we would give them clothes. Mm -hmm. And then number three, we also set up some um, kind of a counseling center, mm -hmm. you know, where people would call mm -hmm. and we would pray with them online. Mm -hmm. And then we would just talk to them about just handling, how do you handle this situation? Mm -hmm. And uh, we were not just talking to them from a spiritual point of view. We were also trying to empower them that right now uh, you're not going to work, yes. Is there any other thing that you can be able to do? Do you have a small piece of land in your backyard mm -hmm. that you can, you know, farm some small spinach and skumawiki? Can you engage in some online business? All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is partly what we were doing as a church. Mm -hmm. Actually, for 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 clarification, uh, clarification purposes, yes. uh, is it, is it the Anglican Church or it's the joint churches that that came together? Because I know you're representing particular. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I really cannot speak uh, for the entire church in Kenya, mm -hmm. but at least the church that God has given me the privilege to serve, the Anglican Church of Kenya. Mm -hmm. At least I know many parishes. That is what they were doing, mm -hmm. and uh, it probably went on social media. You would uh, see a lot of people lining up, probably on a Wednesday or on a Friday. Mm -hmm. You know, lining up in a particular church just to go and receive uh, food and any other thing. And that tells you that the situation, mm -hmm. even some people who never actually gone to church, when it got uh, to the worst of it, mm -hmm. they actually came to church. Mm -hmm. Because that is where they received hope and they received guidance. And can I tell you something? There's always uh, a silver lining in every dark cloud. Mm -hmm. I know of some people right now who have vowed that they are not going back to employment because it is during this season that they became so creative and innovative mm -hmm. and they started doing something mm -hmm. that is giving them much money a lot of money 
than what they used to receive when they were employed. Right. Some of them realized that Kumbia have a hidden ta talent, mm -hmm. you know. Eh, and I think this is what I was saying that we've been introduced into a new into a new normal. Mm -hmm. eh, and so as a church, we just acted as a catalyst, mm -hmm. you know, eh, of doing these things. Yeah, truly self-realization, and now they're actualizing that. Now I want us to move to a different matter. Uh, COVID nineteen came, yes but it found us with, with an existing pandemic, and this is the corruption. Mm. Uh, there will never go a government's project that will not hear of a scandal going on. Now, uh, politically speaking, Socrates, have we had the political will completely to end corruption in our country? Because there are many cases ongoing right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Hilary. The, the, you call it a pandemic also, man. <laughs> I, think, I think we are yet to... We are yet to achieve... To flatten the corruption curve mm -hmm. in, our, in our country. I don't know how long it will take. Uh, investigations have been done. People have been pointed who have stolen lots of money. And, and, and uh, you don't see them convicted for their offenses. Uh, this is because perhaps they are very big guys in the government of the day mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. When COVID-19 came, it got uh, the corruption scourge existing. Mm -hmm. And when, when, when the two, you know, mixed and formed a cocktail, it became a disaster for a recipe for disaster, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just think um, the way Reverend has said that uh, COVID-19 has introduced us to ourselves. We've learned a lot about us that we didn't know. We would say conveniently then that before COVID-19, we were in some sort of comfort zone, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, COVID-19, again, should be a wake-up call, not only for the government of Kenya, for, but governments around the world, that the larger citizenry deserves better services, especially in facets like technology and healthcare. This money is that, you know, it's through COVID-19 that I realized there's a lot of money in government that were hidden. Mm -hmm. the, gov the, the, the president literally cut his salary and that of the executive so that communities can be cushioned, right? Mm -hmm. Monies were taken from the private sector, right? You'd see bank pledging millions and millions of money to cushion the, the less privileged. The, we should not wait for for, for, for COVID-19 to do these things. Mm -hmm. Because we have uh, arid and semi-arid lands. So we have people dying of hunger every day before COVID. We need to move with speed and tap this money that is lost in corruption mm -hmm. and bring it back to the people. We need policy review. We need, we need uh, a reinstitution of these uh, agencies that are tasked to make sure public money is used well. Mm -hmm. And 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 COVID nineteen presented that opportunity to the government of the day. Mm -hmm. Any person, whether the existing president or people who aspire to be presidents, you're only as good as your last so, uh, story. Mm -hmm. If President Uru can uh, find a way of doing a drastic policy review on, on integrity issues in this country, that will be his last good story. So we have an opportunity to end corruption. Let's identify these guys. Let's jail these guys. Let me tell you, today, mm -hmm. if ACC would catch one top politician or two in government mm -hmm. and send them for even five years imprisonment, mm -hmm. a good number, 70%, would shy from stealing government money. And that will be the beginning of a beautiful journey as a country. Uh, the, the other day we were celebrating Waluke's uh, case, uh, the, the fine that he has been uh, given. And by the way, right now we have forgotten about him, Tuliacha <laughs> Kichanga. Kenyans, we forget very fast. Uh, I don't know how many Walukes do we need to arrest and charge in court for yeah. us to learn that corruption is bad. Now, Reverend, what is the role of the church in fighting corruption and impunity in our country? Because it has been rampant in me. Well, I love the way you call corruption a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And rightly so. Because especially in Kenya, anytime you look at the corruption index, mm -hmm. man, it's like uh, <laughs> we are almost taking the medal. 
-hmm. because corruption is in its basic form betrayal of trust mm -hmm. you know the abuse and misuse of entrusted power for personal mm -hmm. you know or private gain mm -hmm. where we entrust you with a public office mm -hmm. uh, thinking that you're going to fight for our interest mm -hmm. and for the interest of the nation mm -hmm. only for you to turn against us and start using the same position and office to enrich yourself you know in mm -hmm. dubious ways mm -hmm. and if left unchecked that is uh, what has landed this nation into a ditch. And by the way, mm -hmm. Kenya is an extremely rich nation. If the natural resources in this nation are prudently managed, mm -hmm. I can tell you for a fact, we would eradicate poverty. All right? All right? Mm -hmm. We would eradicate poverty. But the reason as to why we have become uh, an unjust society and an equal society mm -hmm. is basically because of corruption. Mm -hmm. And I believe from where I'm seated with the whole of my heart, mm -hmm. that we can eradicate corruption. Corruption, Just like Socrates was saying, mm -hmm. that uh, the person who's been found stealing public money, you know, it's not about negotiation. Get them, take them to court, follow due process, mm -hmm. and get them jailed. And apart from being jailed, mm -hmm. get their property and return it back to the public. Mm -hmm. And isn't that what Zacchaeus in the Bible did? Mm -hmm. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and during those days, tax collectors were among the richest people mm -hmm. in the society. You all know why. <laughs> and so one day, Jesus mm -hmm. was passing by, and he was preaching. And by the way, Jesus was a very just person. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't stand in justice. Mm -hmm. He always fought for the rights of the poor, the, uh, the lost, the last, and the least in the society. Mm -hmm. And so... He was bashing, you know, the leaders of the day. And that, that message really permeated hard into the heart of Zacchaeus. And when Jesus actually looked at him, he saw this man is sorrowful. It's like he's changing. Mm -hmm. And he says, by the way, Zach, today I'm dining with you in your house. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, me, I see. I said, yes, you. <laughs> because Jesus had seen an opportunity to transform this man oh. that has been stealing public funds. Mm -hmm. While they were eating in uh, Zacchaeus' house, the guy stands and says, by the way, I've been a corrupt person. He admits mm -hmm. and says, everybody that I've defrauded, I am ready and willing to pay back four times. Mm -hmm. Or oh, what he has taken. Uh, and this is how we introduce justice mm -hmm. into a nation. And so one of the roles of the church mm -hmm. in fighting against corruption is using the pulpit as an advocacy a platform mm -hmm. where you know we meet a lot of people once in a Sunday we have the opportunity to inv to influence a lot of people mm -hmm. and so we use the pulpit as a platform to speak anti-corruption messages and I'm an avid believer that the gospel the mm -hmm. message of the gospel mm -hmm. is not complete without an anti-corruption message Mm -hmm. uh, truly, uh, we will be taking a very short break and when we come back, uh, Socrates will tell us whether we have uh, Zekes who are ready to return what they have taken from the public. Keep sending us your comments or reactions to all our social media platforms, Y254 channel on Facebook and Instagram as well at Y254 channel on Twitter. We take a very short break. Stay with us. Mm -hmm.